Hello, my name is Eddie Hagen from insightsforprint.co. Welcome at this guest lecture at RIT. Now, this isn't the actual recording of the guest lecture. We forgot to ask up front if everybody was okay that we recorded it and published it afterwards. So I did a re-recording, but the contents is the same. So a little bit of background on myself. I started in the printing industry in 1988, which is already a long time ago. I worked a long time for the Belgian Federation for the Printing Industry and a very long time at the Innovation Center for the Printing Industry. In both positions, I was a confidant of many printers and suppliers. They really love to share their insights and their views with me. At this moment, I have a full-time job outside of the printing industry, but print is still a passion of mine. Therefore, I have my blog, insightsforprint.ceo, and I still do some small-scale research. Back in 1988, to set a stage, print was mainly one and two color jobs. Four color jobs, they did exist, but they were mainly printed on two color presses. So after the first two colors, the print has to be washed up and then we could uh, print the third and the fourth color. Quality control, quality assessment was mainly visual. We did have proofs in those days uh, and those were either real prints, usually made by pre-press houses, which made which also made the uh, offset printing plates. So with those printed with those printing plates, with real ink or real paper on a uh, flatbed uh, proofing press. Or on the other hand, we also had very glossy, very vibrant chrome lines, uh, which were also used for as a reference for newspaper ads, which are of course very dull. Since then, a lot has changed. Now my focus has always been on helping printing companies. On the one hand, by debunking hype and exposing flaws, but also on the other hand, promoting, promoting stuff that does work. For instance, Axiom IK, a four color printing process that has a higher gamut than a regular Axiom IK, or providing tools that really work. For instance, in 2011, uh, we already published an ICC profile with a very low total area coverage, 260%, while most ICC profiles in those days had between 350 and 380%. I've strongly supported standardization and international standards. I actively promoted ISO 12647 long before it became fashionable. Um, I was an active member of the Ghent work group for a very long time and you really need to check out their best practices and their tools. So back to the topic of this presentation, brand colors. And um, in the presentation, in the webinar, I included several poll questions. In this re-recording, you will see the results of those poll questions. So the first one was, uh, first question, how important is spot-on brand color reproduction? Almost everybody said that it, was, that it is extremely important. Now, how does that translate into Delta E, spot-on brand color reproduction? Most said two Delta E. Uh, one third, one delta E, and somebody said three delta E. Now everybody knows brand colors are important. That's what defines a brand. So it also needs to be consistent. That's very important. And color is the decisive element in shopping. That's what makes a consumer buy. You can read all kinds of studies on that. And it just makes sense knowing the skill set and the investments, the uh, machines that you need to get print right. Color is the element also for accepting and re rejecting print jobs. Print buyers are the guardians of the brand, and they know that. I've told this many, many times before in all kinds of trainings and presentations. But then, but then I went on a business trip to the States, to the United States, and there the Kellogg Special K was different from here in Belgium, where I live. So why, why, what, what happened? This was really strange to me. And over the years, I've taken a look at, at the Special K, how it evolved. And Kellogg's Special K shifted from red to magenta and now back to red again. So this, this is really weird. This should upset consumers and even disrupt their sales if the narrative is right. That color is so important. It didn't upset consumers it didn't disrupt their sales and look at this this shelf this is a picture from already a long time ago you see three completely different shades of red one is even magenta um, 
and nobody nobody noticed nobody cared only, only i noticed and i took a picture this is also a funny one um this is a washing powder i use for my whitewash uh, dash and i needed a new package i put a new package next to the old one on my shelf and it was there for at least a week or maybe even two weeks before i noticed that the blue was quite different so me the guy who looks at color almost on a daily or hourly basis i didn't notice that it was so different it was it took me a week to notice this also coca-cola the most iconic brand color in the world uh, also this has variations um, i have a collection of a few dozen uh, cans of coca-cola and sometimes they are very different look at the two at the, at the, the left um, these are quite different and um, looking at the time frame they were not uh, that far apart only a few weeks apart um, when i bought them so i need to know more and this eventually led to a groundbreaking study the study i designed um, but it was executed by a student named jens adriansen and he designed a number of or one package and then variations of a package it looks kind of similar like the special kellogg's k that you can find at a breakfast in hotels um, these were printed at the end of an actual print shop so on the uh, right kind of, uh, of uh, cardboard uh, with real inks on a real press finished the same way as those uh, uh, regular boxes. We had nine samples, we had one reference and eight variations. The variation was in the design, um, uh, but there was also one that was identical to the reference and this was what turned out to be a very good idea. Um, so it had a, only a small delta E uh so the, certainly less than 0.3 delta e. for co for the compa sorry for the comparison for the evaluation uh we used a portable uh light box to make sure that everybody looked at it under the same conditions and over 100 people participated in that so how many partic participants claim to see a difference between the identical samples these results from this poll surprised me a little bit that it was uh, so high uh, that's more than one third set between 20 and 39 percent and you know they were right this was groundbreaking about this study one out of three print professionals noticed a difference between identical samples that should not be possible those people they are involved with color on a daily basis they should know that those two were the same but they didn't and by the way if you look uh, at the next uh, the, the next bar in this uh, chart and uh, this is the di distinction of the results between professionals the uh, orange one and yellow the non-professionals in the non-professionals it was a little bit less so we could trust them a little bit more so what happens why did they see a color difference where there is none well it has to do with a very interesting field called uh, behavioral economics and Daniel Kahneman is one of the uh, world famous researchers he got the Nobel Prize uh, for his uh, for his work um, and two concepts that might be at play are framing and priming participants were asked if they saw a color difference so they were looking for a color difference especially the print professionals because they know color they are the color specialists so if you ask them do you see a color difference they will find one even if there is none and this is a real danger in the printing industry on a daily basis just the setting of a press check makes a person more critical if it is done only visually it makes it him or her more critical so how objective is a press check when it's only done visually and this uh, these two packages show uh, the importance of this um daily shock is a, a a biscuit with some chocolate on it um you have two variations on top the milk chocolate at the bottom the dark chocolate but as you may notice the dark chocolate is lighter than the milk chocolate which is in reality is not now i've shown i've shown these packages uh, uh numerous times in uh, presentations and uh during one course um somebody came to me 
uh, during the lunch break and he said, do you want to know the story about that daily shock? I know it because it was printed in our printing company. So we told the story and the first one that was printed was the bottom one, the dark chocolate. And then the press check was done by a person who prefers milk chocolate, the uh, account manager for Daily Shock. So for her, a, a chocolate color that, that looks appealing has to be light. The other one, uh, that this was printed a week later, uh, the account manager for Daily Shock couldn't come, come in for a press check, so it was the press person, or the, the press operator, sorry, that did the press check, and he prefers dark chocolate. So for him, a uh, appealing color for chocolate has to be dark, so therefore the milk chocolate became darker, the dark chocolate became lighter. So this is not really good for process control, if you ask me. Now, looking at those colors and circling at visual color evaluations, well, there is something not really uh, the way it should be. Now, if you look at these packages, uh, these were next to each other in the shelves or on the shelves of a supermarket. I bought both of them because I immediately saw that the yellow was very different. So I put them in front of my girlfriend, uh, who is clever. Um, she uh, she certainly isn't stupid and she certainly isn't uh, colorblind. Um, and I asked her, do you notice anything? She said, you bought two packages? Are you hungry? No, it's not that. Uh, do you notice anything about the packages? Oh, the one of them, the left one here, it has a dent on it. Uh, no, it's not that one. It was only when I started asking questions about the color that she noticed the color difference. Only then she noticed. So this made me uh, assemble a theory called the uncertainty principle of visual color evaluations. You cannot objectively evaluate color differences if you know that you are judging color differences. Once again, you cannot objectively evaluate color differences if you know that you are judging color differences. So a press check it falls under the uncertainty principle. It cannot be objective. So, back to the original test with the small boxes. Uh, the test included both flat samples and folded samples. Uh, are the results more or less the same? And I see that there is a typo in the question. I'm not sure. Well, this is always a good answer. Um, and, well, these were not the same. If you look at the graph here, the number of people that see a color difference should be progressive, but it isn't. You have a gap here. So what happened? Well, probably this happened. Probably what you see here, this Kellogg's box, box and this Kellogg's box is probably the same color, but this one is tilted a little bit. So the light falls on it slightly different uh, which makes the color look a little bit different. So it's probably the slight difference in positioning and light lighting. And by knowing that, by observing that, this shines a whole new light on brand colors in real life. Since the packages are not in the same flat plane, you will never get exactly the same color. So we have to take a look at that uh, more uh, more deeply, we have to investigate that more deeply because maybe we're just nagging about color differences that in real life we can't even see because of the positioning of those packages. So I try to do this, uh, show this in this uh, small animation. Um, you see the one on the left is tilting a little bit, and certainly in the first, between the first and the second step, you can see that the color changes. Uh, I'm not going to say significantly, but you can certainly notice it. Now there's also a big difference between seeing a color difference and being disturbed by it. And even if you are disturbed by it, does, it, does this influence the buying? These were also questions in those, uh, in, in those tests. Now, um, <coughs> I'm sorry, as an afterthought, we should have excluded the people that claim to see a color difference because they, those people were not objective. 
Now this came as an afterthought at the moment when I didn't have access anymore to the original data. But as you can see, that's the number of people that saw a difference. That's the number of people that claimed that it was a little bit of disturbing. So there is a real difference between both of them. So let's take a look at color memory, because if a color difference in real life would influence um, buying behavior, our color memory has to be really good. So how good is your color question? Uh, sorry, your color memory, which was the next uh, poll question, on the scale from one to five, and it was in the middle, which is also quite good. So if confused. Consumers would refuse to buy a product when the color is not right. Our color memory should be very good, even spot on. Now, what does research about color memory say? And I have to admit, most research comes from outside of the printing industry. Well, this is the first one from Johns Hopkins, and their conclusion was, brain generalizes millions of colors to the best versions of basic colors, uh, research suggests. So, all colors are put in, I believe it was 12 or something, uh, color categories, so name it buckets, um, and we have an ideal color for that, so we always adjust our color memory to uh, that uh, best version. This is another study on delayed and undelayed uh, color memory. So in the first one, people were shown a specific color, then one second um, a blank one and then on the color wheel they had to pick the right version well this was not easy most people didn't do it right and even in an undelayed estimation so here the square with the right color and people should identify where it was even there it was uh, difficult our color memory uh, didn't work properly and this is a real life example, <laughs> I still have to laugh when I, I see it. Uh, it's embarrassing even. This is my uh, the granola I use in the morning and uh, I usually buy this one. Um, and at a certain point uh, I, was, uh, uh, I opened a new box and it tasted differently. And I couldn't, I couldn't find a reason and a few days later I noticed it's peanuts. I'm, I'm lacking peanuts in my uh, granola. And only then I found out that I bought this variety, the Asian grains. Both are kind of orange, but they are very different. At least delta E of 10 between uh, the two oranges. So when shopping, I just picked the wrong one. I knew that, that I had to take orange one and I picked the wrong orange. So me, once again, the guy who's involved with color a lot, he picked the wrong orange in the shop. Now the most iconic brand color, that's of course Coca-Cola Red. It's their second, second secret formula. Um, as they say on the website, there is no Pantone color for Coca-Cola Red, but when you see it, you know it. Yeah, right. So I uh, designed a test, an online color memory test. Can you correctly remember Coca-Cola Red? So I had um, six variations of red, all brand colors, by the way. Um, also Adobe, Tesla, uh, Vodafone, uh, Ferrari, I think, uh, were involved in this test. Um, let's see the results. Um, I had 395 participants and there is no agreement. Now, the interesting part of this test was the design of the test. It was a sequence of colors. They were not next to each other and they were certainly not overlapping each other. So let's take a look with 395. You can see the Delta E, so this is the right one. And the right one is not the most popular one. The most popular one is the one with the four Delta E difference. And for a long time, uh, the one with the highest difference was even popular. So this with 9.2 was even popular than the right one. Uh, it is only the last 100 uh, uh, participants that it shifted a little bit. So, now the poll question, was this a valid test? And two out of three said only under specific conditions. And right you are, because you should only do this test on a calibrated monitor. And let's take a look. From those 395, only 93 used a calibrated monitor. But still, 
This one is the most popular one. Not this one. And people from the printing industry, they know color. How about that? Well, the gray one, 262. Uh, slightly less than um, all of them. Um, so even the 9.2 is a little bit more popular than the correct one. But people from the printing industry with a calibrated monitor. And by the way, 78% of people from the printing industry did not use a calibrated monitor. They did a test on an uncalibrated monitor. Shame on them. So this was slightly better, but still um, the overall average was uh, better. And still uh, the one with 4.3 delta E difference was more popular than the right one. But also in real life, I've seen lots of differences. I have, as I already mentioned, a nice collection of Coca-Cola ca cans. And also they include differences by design. Um, for a very long time, we had in Belgium, in Europe, metal cans with a white base uh, plus an opaque ink, but these days we have now aluminium cans with a transparent ink. The perception of that color is very, very different. Also, this was told, uh, this was shared once in a, in a discussion on LinkedIn, the Christmas version is darker. So when brand colors are that important that you can have no deviation and during Christmas you say, oh well, now, you make it a little bit darker. What, what, does tell, what, does, what does that tell about one brand colors and two uh, consumers? Are they less critical during that time or what, what's that all about? And this, this is uh, one summer. Um, they shifted from this color to that color. So that's quite a different color. Before it, they also had that one. So that's really different. So I checked their website, whether their words was a fact, a frequently asked questions or a special notice or a newsletter uh, that something went wrong with uh, their uh, production and uh, sorry about the bad colors. There were no complaints, there was no information. So nobody noticed except me, probably. Now, once again, to that uh, priming and framing, <laughs> I did a short three-part test on LinkedIn. Uh, so this was the first one. Any thoughts on this? Please share them in, your, in the comments. Almost no reaction. But when I said this, it, it's the same. You have one can that is damaged, same here, and different colors. What do you think? Which one is the correct red? Hit like, celebrate and so on to share your opinion. And I had a five time higher interaction than in the first post. So just by mentioning that it's about color makes people uh, interact more with, uh, with, 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 uh, with a question like that. And when I put this in a group call to print production professionals, I had more than 200 reactions within 24 hours. This is probably the most uh, popular uh, post that, uh, I made in that group. And I also got four different Pantone numbers and four different CMYK equivalents. So that special unique Coca-Cola Red, it's all over the place. I'm sorry, but uh, this is, uh, there's something wrong. And you, you can here clearly see the uh, priming edit. Since a lot of you are color experts, oh yes, I'm a color expert, I want to participate. This is Coca-Cola Red in real life. Here, there is a clear difference in lighting, making the color look very different. Uh, this is just a number of examples from my collection. So this is the winter version, which is darker. Uh, this is an aluminum can with transparent ink, completely different color perception. Uh, this is also a package, a six pack, and the color shifts. This red is certainly different from that red. That's what shadows do. So what, what is the right Coca-Cola? You can't control everything. Also here, uh, due to the shrink wrap, I'm going to put a mask on top of it. And, sorry, 
that was, I have to go back one. I'm sorry. I'm well, on the previous one, uh, I put a mask on it, and you can see that it is a very different uh, color. Um, also, this one was in a vending machine uh, in a shop, and this red is completely different from that red. So this is Coca-Cola red in real life. Now, also, sometimes it is flawed by design. If you have a design like this, if that red and that red is even identical when you measure it with a spectrophotometer, well, it will look different due to the white of the logo and the red of the logo. So it is extremely difficult to get an identical uh, perception of that brand. And Kellogg's, uh, I don't know who decided all those designs, but if you see all those different boxes the red if the red even if the red is the same due to the background which is very different every time the perception of the brand color will be different we already mentioned color perception um, you have um, nice examples on the internet so here we have color contrasts this is the same color but due to the surrounding color it looks very different here, it looks the same, the one in the middle, but actually those are different colors. So how are we going to deal with that one? Now I've published a number of articles on uh, both Coca-Cola and, uh, and Kellogg's uh, in real life. And an old, co old contact from a Flexo pre-press sorry, pre -press house uh, contacted me and he said, oh, Milka would never allow these kinds of deviations. So I went to my supermarket and uh, I bought a number of Milka packages. Measured them and put them next to each other in this graph and you can see this is very different. Now how Rocksort or Foolproof or Brand Color Guidelines uh, according to you? This was another poll question and um, the participants were already a little bit uh, reluctant to say that everything was foolproof. Now look at uh, Milka, the last example I showed you. This is the Milka brand guide. By the way, a Coca-Cola brand guide, it's difficult to find. It's even impossible to find the official one. Milka, you can find it. And look at this. This comes from a textile Pantone guide. It's not textile that they're printing on. It's flexibles and and cart carton that they are printing on not, not something very different. You should not do that. This is a completely different reference that they are using. Now, is using a Pantone number a good idea to define a brand color, yes or no? I'm glad that so many people agreed it is not. A Pantone number is not a good idea. And take a look at this. This is the uh, Red Cross, different brand guys from different uh, countries. Um, and they all start with the same color, being Pantone uh, 485. You can see it here and here and here. And eventually the colors that come out of it um, in hex, for instance, or RGB is different. Also CMYK is different. So you start with a Pantone number and you get a very different color. That's not good. Now those Pantone color guides what many people don't know is that uh, the differences between different copies of that guide, uh, they can be up to 2 delta E. They have a 2 delta E tolerance, but even more, about 10% of the colors is outside that 2 delta E tolerance. And what's even more disturbing, we don't know which ones. So you could have, in the best case scenario, uh, when colors are within that 2 delta E from the ideal value, you can have colors in two guides being 4 delta E apart, because delta E doesn't show any direction. So one guide can be 2 delta E in one direction, and the other, excuse me, color guide can be 2 delta E in the opposite direction, so being 4 delta E apart. So that's not good. Uh, so this information, the uh, 
rectangle at the bottom comes from their website uh, when they were claiming that they had enhanced the product. Uh, you will appreciate tighter tolerances, 90% at a 2 delta E or lower. So 10% outside of that 2 delta E. So I did a reality check. I asked um, a number of uh, readers of my blog, so both printers and designers and brand owners, um, a number of questions about their color guides. One of us, them was the age. And you can see here, most of them were within a reasonable age, but there were still a lot of them um, that already have a, a rather a serious age. And how were they used for picking colors or a physical reference or both? Well, all of them were also used as a physical reference. So if you have a 16 or an 18 year old guide as a reference for print shops, that's not a good idea. In the past, there were significant differences between two editions. And this is a picture from 2012. Reflex blue, reflex blue. This is very different from that. Also 280C versus this 280C, very different. Paper white was also very, rather different, uh, but the blues, they were very, very different. So part of that reality check I just talked about, um, a number of people also measured four patches in their guides. So I have 21 Pantone color guides, four patches measured. You can see here the Delta E and the uh, different patches, red 32, blue 72, green and 100, all in the coated guides. The average and the maximum deviation uh, versus the digital value. This is Delta E2. So 90% of the colors should be below that. It's not the case. It's absolutely not the case. If you look at the AB plane, uh, you can see where all the different colors were, and especially in the yellow one, was, it's, it's a difficult one. And here in the blue one, there is one with a very high deviation. Now, okay, those were 21 color guides. Um, uh, what I didn't notice at first was uh, they should be within their warranty. Somebody, one of their readers, one of the readers of my blog uh, mentioned that. So I took out all those that were too old. Um, but still then, this is the 2 delta E. Only the average of the green one was below the 2 delta E, but the rest was uh, above that one. So H was mm, a little bit in play, but not completely. So maybe differences between measurement devices. So now I only checked the x right exact uh, devices and Pantone guides that were within warranty. Still, 2 delta E difference, only the green one. As a, the average is good, uh, the maximum is still above the 2 delta E, but the others are above the specifications that Pantone gives. Maintenance, only recently maintained um, exact <coughs> devices, um, still certainly the yellow one, big differences, green still rather good, red uh, becomes a little bit more into the region of the uh, official uh, tolerance. Now another thing also with Pantone numbers is, well, sometimes they are selling illusions. If you look at the color differences of adjacent colors and it didn't take a long time to find these two samples, these two examples, it took me a few minutes. Um, the difference between 2747 and 2748, it's 0.6 delta E. Between 100C and 3935C, it's even only 25, 0.25 delta E. That's, well, I, I don't know what to say. <laughs> it's amazing, it's, it's almost criminal that they are selling a product like that um, designers think that this is real-life uh, print, uh, that, that, that they can achieve this over and over again. Well, you can't, because the deviations the Pantone guides have um, with, the, uh, with, with, with the ideal value and between different uh, guides, they are much higher than the, deviation, than the difference between these two pairs. It's, they can be up to 2 delta E, so what you see, the difference between those colors can be very different. 
Not recently, last year, they uh, launched some new guides. Um, what was it called again? The uh, CMYK, new CMYK guides with uh, even more colors. So I asked them, and here it is. What is the color deviation average maximum between the color specifications mentioned in the patches? Patches, sorry. So the ideal color and the printed colors. And what is the deviation average and maximum between different copies of the printed guide? A valid question, I think. You know what answer I got? Hi, Eddie. We don't know yet. So they were selling this, those, those guides already and they didn't know what the deviations were. If one of their customers, a print buyer, would get such a print shop from a printer, he would reject it. He would send it back. But Pantone think they can do it like that. I'm sorry, but this is this is this is amazing, and we stu we should stop using Pantone guides this way. So if you pick your new brand color from a color guide, it's probably not 100% the same as a digital reference. It could well be two delta E off, best case scenario. Could be 10% of the colors, could be more. So what do you do? Do you use a digital reference, which is different from what you saw, or do you measure it and use that uh, as the uh, reference in the future? Uh, in my opinion, the second one is a good option. So we also need better brand guides. Think about that Milka one with a reference to textile Pantone numbers. So I've made a proposal for better brand guides, but please do elaborate on that. Uh, do make a better suggestion. And what we certainly need is a science-based reference, not a Pantone number, the correct derived colors, both digital and printed. Um, and when digital, both sRGB and Adobe RGB, don't forget that, those are very different ones. You always have to tag your RGB colors with the right profile. Uh, coated and uncoated, and a special attention there for the conversion. Um, probably, probably we should also mention the closest matches in color systems like Mensal, Natural Color System, Pentone, HKS, and RAL. So it might look something like this, where you have the insights for prints.co orange, this color, which in LAB has these values, and then the derived colors in sRGB, hex, sRGB, and Adobe RGB printed, and then the closest matches to the science-based color systems and the spot color, spot color systems and paint, and also with a note about several colors. If you are a student and you want uh, to improve on it, please uh, feel free to do it. You can always contact me if you have proposals. Uh, I will be glad to respond to that. Now, we've been looking at the uh, color production uh, print side uh, of it. Uh, but how about consumers? Uh, how do they look at, uh, at color? Well, shopping behavior and brand loyalty um, well, it's, it's a little bit different than what we think. So, do consumers notice or even care about slight color differences? I did a study, <coughs> an online study, with over 100 participants, all regular shoppers, and only a few, two, I think, uh, from the printing industry. I made sure that there was no framing and priming. I chose the questions very carefully. There was nothing you could uh, find about the real goal of the uh, of the survey, which was investigating the, the importance of color. I said that it was a survey on shopping behavior, uh, all kinds of questions on that, and in a few there was a mention of color. And I also added some control questions. So, what has the biggest influence on brand loyalty? What are the reasons for buying another brand? Well, promotions, and not in stock. Only very few people said when it looks different than normal. Only a very few. And this is what they responded in a survey. Uh, in real life, probably they would also buy the product. I showed them the same uh, deviations uh, used in that uh, online test that I showed you with the Coca-Cola Red. And 
asked which color they would not trust as Coca-Cola Red. Then it also had an option, all are acceptable. And almost two out of three said that all colors were acceptable. And there were a few persons that said that the right one was not acceptable, that they would not trust that. So it's, it's all up to Delta E of four. It's a very small amount of people that would not trust it. Um, so we are quite tolerant to uh, deep color deviations. I also explicitly asked what they would do when the color looks different. And three out of four said, I'll buy it anyway. The others, except one person, and he was from the printing industry, except one of them, they all said, um, they said, uh, I'll postpone my purchase. So when looking at it, when asking it in a different way and looking at it in a different way, people don't really care about color deviations as long as it's not too high. Delta E of 4 was completely acceptable for most people. Uh, and it was it is, it is only one person in this survey and it was one person from the printing industry um, who was the least regular shopper uh, that, that told this. So whether this is valid or not, I'm not sure. Um, so having a delta E of two or even one, it doesn't make any sense. Brand loyalty is really high. And so while I was doing that survey, <laughs> um, interestingly enough, I saw this package in a supermarket. This is a damaged package. I went to the supermarket every day, every single day, to see whether it was sold or not. And after three days, it was sold. So even this one got sold. That's amazing. And by the way, if you compare this color with this color, although it's this, almost the same design, it's a different red. <coughs> Excuse me. This was also confirmed by a thesis by Kate Gogwin, I hope I pronounced it correctly, which was a student at RIT, by the way. Uh, the influence of color on purchasing decisions related to product design. And her conclusion, uh, both genders agree that quality is not something that they would ever be, that would ever be sacrificed for the perfect color. So people, uh, I'm sorry, uh, product quality convinces people not the color of the package or the color color quality of the package, I should say. But what about all those studies? You can read all, all those studies that, uh, that color is this important. So what about all those studies? Well, I know there are a lot of references and quotes circulating and for a long time I've heard and accepted all of them without questioning. But a few years ago I had a little bit too much free time and I took a deep dive. So for instance this one. People make up their minds within 90 seconds of their initial interactions with either people or products, and about 62 to 90 percent of the assessment is based on colors alone. This is a quote from this uh, paper, Impact of Color on Marketing. Um, however, there is absolutely no proof of this claim in this paper. It's only shown in the introduction and without any reference. I contacted the writer of that paper. He never replied to me. Color increases brand recognition by 80%, what is commonly known as the Loyola study. Now, this was a very difficult one to find. Um, and the first appearance seems to be a Xerox leaflet to promote office color printers, either from 2000 or 2000, 2001 or 2005. It looked like this. 20 ways to share the color knowledge. <clears throat> and one of the quotes, one of the claims is color can improve brand recognition by up to 80%. Now, here are a number, oops, a number of sources. And one of the sources is Loyola College uh, with Alan Hoadley as the principal writer. But there are also other sources. Now, why that is important, I will get to that in a second. And one of those sources is also the Bureau of Advertising Color in Newspaper Advertising. So I contacted Alan Houtley, um, and this is what that Loyola study is 
really about investigating the effects of color, font, and bold highlighting in text for the end user. Now, remember, this is a study from late 90s, early 2000s. This was a time when most printers uh, in offices were black and white, when even a lot of uh, monitors in an office environment were not color. So she investigated what the effect of color would be, for instance, in a uh, Excel uh, chart uh, as the main example. That was what that Loyola study was about. Nothing else. So there are studies emphasizing the importance of color, but most of the time that is a comparison to black and white, so the effect of color in newspaper ads. And that was the other reference in that Xerox leaflet, so the uh, color enhances brand recognition by 80%. This comes from color in newspaper ads, and there are many of those studies, even going back to the 1930s, if I'm correct. Um, it was shown over and over again that if you uh, had a color ad, it had a higher um, higher recognition than a black and white ad, which is, of course, obvious. Or there is a focus on color categories, a red sweater versus a green sweater. You will rather fast make up your mind that you want a red sweater or not a green sweater, but the uh, variation of, uh, of red, if it's uh, uh, cherry red or uh, name any other red, um, that may be a little bit more difficult. And what it is certainly not on is on tiny tolerances. So for instance, the, inf the, the difference between Pantone 484 and 485 red, it's not on that one. It's on color or no color. So in conclusion, some of those claims are unproven, unproven and others are taken out of context. And if you look at studies always check the wording, the setting, priming and framing. If you ask a person, is color important? They will answer, yes, it's important. Because otherwise, why would you do this survey? Now recently, um, there was a really interesting uh, article, presentation, uh, YouTube video on neuromarketing. Um, the use of color in neuromarketing, and I do believe that you have to have the right color or color category, I should say, for a specific type of brand or products or services. Um, but one of the examples shown was the Google 41 or 50 Shades of Blue test. And uh, Google did a B testing with uh, different types of blue, which would give the best result, the highest click ratio, so the best earning for them. Now, the test result was that when they changed uh, they are blue to a different blue that it uh, had an increase of 200 million US dollar extra in search advertising revenue. Now, another poll question, was this a valid test? So, uh, the participants of the webinar, um, they already knew that they couldn't trust me uh, in everything. So they said only under certain conditions and the rest said, I'm not sure. Indeed, it's only in certain conditions that that, test, that that this kind of test can be valid. And Google did not control the output of the screens. And they can never control the output of the screens of the monitors. And these are two monitors, uh, two different laptops next to each other, the same color, the color that came out of that test, uh, 2200 CC. And just look at it this is a very different color from that one. So it's completely invalid. And yes, they made more money because it was growing. Search advertising was growing. And by the way, it was less than a 1% increase, less than 1% increase in advertising revenue. That's random. That's a random result to me. And by the way, Microsoft did the same A-B test at more or less the same time and they found a different blue being that one. And by the way, they made more money than Google after the AB, AB test. There was a higher increase, I should say. So other very relevant studies. Uh, this is one from Jesper Clement, or Clement uh, understanding consumer in-store uh, 
visual perception, the influence, influence of package design features on visual attention. Now, this is an interesting one because this used the eye tracking. So it was not asking questions to a consumer, no, no, no. It was eye tracking, so it was really seeing or investigating what, what people were looking at. At this conclusions, physical design features such, such as shape and contrast dominate the initial phase of searching. So shape and contrast. We conclude that consumers' first eye contact depends on simple physical design features, meaning features with a little semantic uh, content facilitates initial attention. And the regression analysis did not find a significant relation for design features like size, typography, brand letters, brand pictures, and color. So no significant relation to color. Another one, uh, Color Matching from Memory by Helen H. Epps in 2004. Uh, this was a color memory test with a short delay and in only 40% of the cases the right color was chosen, even though the uh, differences were high. The bottom one is always the reference color. These are the variations and the number of people that chose the right one. So this is bad. We count, our color memory is really bad, we count correctly remember a brand color. So to conclude, um, one, there is no justification for a two delta E tolerance on brand colors. Technology might not be up to the task. Uh, consumers won't be influenced by higher tolerances as I've shown in my tests. Priming and framing are a real danger when doing visual assessments. Remember my theory, the uncertainty principle for visual color evaluation and also Keep this in mind when doing our studies on color or reading about studies on color. Priming and framing are a real danger. They could influence the results. They will influence the results. Often mentioned studies are taken out of context or have no evidence. And there are other studies that you can find that prove even the opposite. Do embrace standards like G7 in the US, uh, PSO, PSD, ISO 12647, all the the other ISO standards do embrace them. They are solid, they have good tolerances, and they are within reach for every skilled printer. By the way, APS, if color is really that critical for real world consumers, would we see something like this? I've already shown this. Would a shop owner place these two very different cans of Coca Cola next to each other, risking loss of sales? I don't think so. Now, since the attendees of the webinar were uh, students, a few research tips. One, this is something that has not been researched before. It was a part of the groundbreaking study that I talked about, the one that I designed, but it should be um, researched much more deeply. Color perception in three dimensions, so not only flat samples, so the influence of round objects, uneven objects like pouches, the folds and stuff like that. Also the influence of placement packages that, not are, that are not perfectly in line. So as a consequence, have a different lighting. What is the influence uh, of, all those, uh, of all those factors on color perception and on color production on brand, uh, brand colors, brand color tolerances? Also, an inter interesting exercise would be to document a real-life brand color workflow. How are they picked, those new brand colors? How are they described, so the brand color guides? How are, how are they controlled throughout the complete process from start to finish? And finish, I mean the placement in the shop. Identify the variables, uh, for instance, measuring the color guides that they use to pick the new color. Uh, comparing to the digital value, checking calibration, tolerances of measurement devices, but describing it only, not intervening it. And only document the flow and address the issues in the final report, compare these with uh, ISO standards and best practices. Brand colors in real life, identify issues and variables in shopping environments. That would also be an interesting one. Um, color evaluation in printing. The influence of lighting, so P1 versus P2, um, on seeing color differences. Now, the reference P1 and P2 comes from an ISO standard on 
the conditions how you can evaluate uh, print and color. Um, if I'm not mistaken, P1 is the one next to the printing press, so with a lot of light. P2 is the practical appraisal of print, so this is uh, with a normal amount of light, 500 lux, so like, a, like a, an office environment. Um, so it will be interesting to see uh, where the, 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 the how much how, how good we can uh, see color differences under those two different conditions. Also, the influence of the distance between the proof and the sample on seeing color differences. I will show this in a second in an image. Um, samples on top of each other, next to each other in sequence, what the influence of that is. Also, the influence of time looking at samples. If you look 5 seconds, 10 seconds, half a minute, 1 minute, does it make a difference? And also, wet versus dry samples, the evaluation sorry, the evolution of color in 24 hours in 48 hours. So this image, um, this, this has to do with the, uh, the ICC profiles with a very low total area coverage that I talked about at the beginning. We also made a test suite and these were images um, printed with the different profiles. So I guess this was 300 to 80 to 60 and to 20. Uh, percent. Now, if you add a white border, it's very difficult to see the differences. Um, uh, by the way, there must be in a different uh, different order than the one I said. But there were four different uh, four different uh, percentages. Um, so, if you put a white border around it, it's very difficult to see the differences. Uh, we also did a small test with that on an exhibition, um, and people really had a hard time to uh, to distinguish them. But if you cut out the white and put them on top of each other, it's very easy to uh, put them in the right order. Now this is this is not ink, this is paint. This is wet paint, this is dry paint. This also happens with ink. And I can tell a horror story about that. Uh, uh, one time, one of my contacts, uh, uh, his customer was doing a press check, uh, signed off a sheet. And two days later, or three days later, she got the uh, uh, the complete order, and she rejected it. Why? Because it looked different from what she saw at the printing press. At the printing press, it had a nice, nice uh, shiny gloss on it because the ink was wet, and when she received it, the ink was dry and the shiny gloss was away. Also, um, we were when I was at the Innovation Center, we were also involved in certification for ISO 12647 and at one time there was a print shop uh, printed in Spain I believe and a few samples were shipped to us uh, uh, with the courier um, uh, via plane uh, so we measured it within 24 hours after being printed and the rest of the uh, production run which was a really large production run uh, came with a truck and this arrived a few days later the first sample which came in via plane, this was within the uh, tolerances uh, specified by ISO 12647. The other ones which arrived a few days later were outside. It was the same press run, the only difference was uh, the time frame within which the measurements were done. So there is also a shift during uh, drying uh, unless you work with uh, uh, UV curing inks, uh, things like that. Um, number five, research tips. Replicating my color perception test, one with the boxes. I would love to see people um, reproduce that. Please do contact me uh, to get the right uh, or, or the same uh, setup and uh, questions to ask uh, the participants. Also, real life tests with different colors. So, would it make a difference uh, if in the cafeteria? For instance, at RIT or another university or whatever, if you would sell Coca-Cola cans that look slightly different, do people notice and will some of them not get sold? One that irritates me, uh, still irritates me, ICC conversions, color conversions. I'm very in front of them, except for blue. Blue turns purple. Uh, blue, st blue still turns purple, um, especially in newspaper printing, but you can also see this in other kinds of printing. Um, 
uh, two years ago, I published a book uh, with a lot of pictures uh, with very deep blues, deep and dark blues. I had to go to a very different solution uh, because the regular print, uh, CMYK print, it would all turn purple. And I did it eventually, and that's number eight in XCMYK. There was a printer who could uh, do that for me on a Xerox Irides, uh, which is a four color digital press, but it has a bigger gamut. And um, uh, it would be nice to see a, or to deepen the studies that already exist, a comparison between XCMYK and CMYK OGV, orange, green, and violet. So four color printing versus seven color printer printing. And uh, Kiran Teshpanda, Teshpandi, has already done some research on it, and according to his research, um, the seven color press printing process is only, four, the gamut is only 14% larger than the uh, XCMYK. So this is amazing to me. We see, we see a lot of uh, packaging and label printers going into CMYK OGV or expanded gamut printing, as you also call it. But these are extra colors with extra costs. So if you can do this in CMYK, in XCMYK, so four colors, but a higher density or um, slightly different uh, pigments, why wouldn't you do that? I don't get it. This is a picture from my color book, uh, my, my Corona photo book. So during the first uh, two weeks of, uh, sorry, two months of the lockdown, um, I made pictures of Antwerp every evening and it was a desolate uh, Antwerp, but it was always taken in the blue hour with lots of deep blues. So this is a conversion with XCMYK. This is a regular uh, conversion with an ordinary CMYK profile. I tried uh, four or five of them, uh, different uh, regular CMYK profiles in all of them. It became purple. Some more advice for the future, trust but verify. All truths, you might trust them, but certainly verify them and also other claims, verify them. Design your tests carefully. Beware of priming and priming, I already said it a number of times. Behavioral economics, it does play when you're doing studies. Never tell participants what your tests are about, what your goal is. Uh, be careful with questions like, is color important? Yes, of course, why would you ask it? <laughs> Uh, building control questions and other checks, like for instance, that identical copy in my um, color perception test. And the devil is in the details. Remember the Google's 41 shades of blue. Interesting test, but it could not control the output, so invalid. And never forget, you can absolutely still do groundbreaking work in the color area. I really, really mean that. And you can always contact me to get some ideas, to get some feedback. I will be happy to do that. Desire test carefully the control questions, the other checks. Uh, I talked about the uh, shopping behavior. Uh, for instance, I had the question, reasons for buying other brands. This included a, um, a question on looking different. And then I still had a few questions later. What would you do when color looks different? And it's more or less similar. Um, it doesn't make any, any difference for a consumer. Also, that control question, the identical copy that uh, we included in that perception test, um, and looking both at flat samples, as has been done usually, and folded boxes, which are a completely different uh, area of color perception. So, to conclude, also some homework for you. Uh, I always love to do that. Measure every Pantone color guide that you can get your hands on. And do that for the following patches, red uh, 32C, blue 72C, green C, and 100C. You can submit the measurements via this link. Um, I will also ask you to include the age of the color guide, the brand and the device name of the spectrophotometer, the measurement condition, the age of the spectrophotometer, the last maintenance and the last calibration. <coughs> if you do that, I can add it to my uh, statistics, to my uh, study on Pantone color guides in real life. Buy Coca-Cola cans um, everywhere where you go, when you go, when you are at home, when you are at work, when you are in university and bring them 
and, and, and place them next to each other. Um, for the students of RIT, I suggested to bring them to Rochester and compare all the cans so that you can see what the deviations in real life are. <coughs> Sorry. And especially this one, this homework, read this book. It reads like a thriller, it's amazing, and it will help you in life. Uh, you will get a, a much better insight in how people think, how they act, and how uh, unpredictable we are. So this is one that we're going to skip since this is not a live recording. Um, and I want to thank you for listening. If you have any suggestions, if you want to check something with me, please feel free to contact me. I'm always happy to help people uh, with their color stuff. Uh, and once again, thanks for listening.